We are uh, thrilled to uh, invite Bruce Alter. Uh, Bruce is uh, living, working, and working in the uh, the Tiger Tualatin School District, um, bringing change on a district, uh, state, and national level with the work uh, he's been doing on AI and accessibility and beyond. Uh, today, Bruce's session is entitled Embracing the AI Revolution. Talk about a timely topic. I'm going to stop sharing and ask Bruce to start sharing his screen. And uh, I asked briefly earlier where everybody is in the world of AI, and some of you have a toe in it. I know that Bruce has been involved in this for years and watching it evolve. And so you're going to get a perspective that now um, is in demand across our country. Uh, Bruce, I don't want to intimidate you by uh, building you up to star status, but I think I might have already done that. So please take over and uh, tell us uh, how AI is going to help us. <laughs> My robot overlords would like to welcome you to this talk. No, just joking. First off, before I dive in, uh, this is a real age test. I don't know how many people recognize this screenshot from the movie Dr. Strangelove or how I learned to stop worrying and love the bomb. So I apologize, but maybe for many of us, uh, therapy is about as well loved as uh, the nuclear bomb is. I want to, I'm really grateful to see so many friends and colleagues. I've been doing quite a bit of talking and this is the first chance I've had to speak to this group. Now, first, I want to give you our new slogan. We do this not because it is easy, but because we thought it would be easy. I think that sums up a lot of things that happen. So let me introduce myself to those of you who I don't know. So I'm Bruce Alter. I think I know probably most of the folks here. I'm a pediatric PT and I'm an AT consultant. And I provide these services to Woodburn and Tiger Walton School Districts in Oregon. And I need to move my screen. There we go. But long before that, I was a geek. I actually started playing and programming on mainframe computers back in the 70s. And in the 80s, I worked on expert systems using an, an ancient language called Lisp. I've been following developments in AI since then. In fact, I met the woman who became my wife because of AI. And I mentioned this to the Secretary of Education, Miguel Cardona, when I was part of an expert panel to provide info on AI and education to him. And if he ever makes it to Oregon, I have a standing offer to have a beer with him to tell him the whole story. However, if we have time and you ask me at the end, I'll tell you how AI back in the 80s led me to meeting the woman who became my wife. I've been doing presentations on generative AI ever since last school year, so since 2022. Most recently, I spoke at an assistive technology conference in Florida, and then last week for cast.org, but this is my first opportunity to speak to my school therapists, brother and sisters. And again, thank you for the opportunity. I wanna stress that the purpose of this presentation, unlike many others I do where I'm talking about policy or uh, things that students uh, can use AI for, this is for you to learn skills that you can start using immediately. These skills will improve the quality of the paperwork you have to do while decreasing the amount of time you spend on it. And I'm sure some of you, if you're like me, will open a browser window on your computer while you're watching this presentation and start trying some of the stuff. And I'm telling you, that's okay. That To me, that's a sign of a good presentation. But to get there, you need to have enough background to understand how to use Gen AI. So if you don't find the next part of the presentation on AI and how it works scintillating, just wait a little bit. There'll be some actionable stuff coming up pretty quickly. So I'm going to start by providing some information on artificial intelligence. And the reason for doing this is it'll help you better understand the strengths and weaknesses of some of today's systems if you know a bit about how they work. Please keep in mind there are many types of artificial intelligence, and most of us use some of them daily, including facial recognition when we unlock our phone or when online merchants provide suggestions for movies or things they think we want to buy. But for this presentation, when I talk about AI, I'm talking specifically about generative AI and what that is and how it works will become clear in a few minutes. First, a small bit of history. Artificial intelligence was first proposed in the late 40s and 50s. Later, the field of expert systems tried to mimic what human experts did by programming the decisions they made into a computer. So they'd find someone who was an expert, a human who was an expert, 
and they try to write procedural code to do the same thing as that expert. However, the hardware and methods used were insufficient to create meaningful, generalizable systems. In the early 2010s, a combination of neural networks and machine learning really hit its stride. Neural networks are software that mimics the way the human brain works, and machine learning, unlike earlier expert systems, enables computers to learn and make decisions from data without being explicitly programmed. These technologies and programming methods require vast amounts of data, and that's now available on the internet. It also requires state-of-the-art, expensive, fast graphical processing units or GPUs that can run these deep neural networks. And you may have been hearing about some of that on the news. And now let me explain in detail a small part of the mathematics. No, I'm just kidding. I'm not gonna go into that. So let's go with this diagram. So this is a symbolic diagram about how deep neural networks operate. Information goes in the input layer and then in hidden layers, and that's actually what they're called. Neurons pass information between each other, including sometimes back to earlier neurons, depending on architecture. And they make decisions based on weights or how important the network thinks that information is to the eventual outcome. The real point of this diagram, other than hiding all the beautiful mathematics, is to realize we don't fully understand how these networks make their decisions. And this means that the reasoning process is largely a black box, and this is intrinsic to the models. So if you're going to use these models, you're going to have these hidden layers. There may be billions of decision points feeding their output forward to each other. But for us, that means we can't always rely on the results because we may not fully understand how they're generated. It's very different from standard computer code where when something goes wrong, you can troubleshoot it by running through the code step by step and finding where the error is. You can't do that with these systems. And since the data used to train these models comes from different sources on the internet, it will reflect the same biases and prejudices as the people who put the data there. So I have an article in the reference section that discusses ways to set up prompts, which I'll be talking about a lot through this, that can minimize bias. Just assume you're going to be dealing with inaccuracies, biases, and prejudices whenever you use these models. But frankly, we always need to consider that when we're getting information from the internet. So these networks are referred to as deep neural networks because of the number of layers they have. Information about how many layers commercial networks have is proprietary. And when you use deep neural networks in machine learning, it's called deep learning. So here's another important term. A large language model is a type of AI trained to understand, generate, and respond to human language. A large language model, large language models are what power the current explosive growth of generative AI. So here's the key takeaway. Generative AI is made possible by large language models that use machine learning and deep neural networks to generate responses to prompts that users put in. And this technology is only possible because of the vast amounts of data available for training and the specialized GPUs that each cost about as much as a small car. And these large language models are extremely costly to run. A recent estimate I saw was the chat GPT cost more than $600,000 a day just to run due to the energy it consumes. A lot of that's spent on cooling. So generative AI is now built into a number of applications that you may already be using. Some institutions allow their use, others aren't. And for the sake of this presentation, I'm gonna focus on the big three Gen AI providers that you can view via the web or an app. And I should have said this at the beginning, but I'd like to go all the way through before I answer questions. And uh, for those of you who do know me, I have ADHD. So I have the chat turned off. It's hard enough for me just to focus on, well, I have two screens. No, I have three screens here. It's hard for me to focus just on one screen. So I'm gonna continue with that. So ChatGPT, which I'm sure everyone has heard of, was the first large language model to be available to the general public. GPT stands for Generative Pre-Trained Transformer. So this means it was pre-trained with data, so it's not accessing the most recent information available on the web unless you make certain requests. A transformer is an advanced machine learning uh, model. I'm gonna go into this for just a second. Transformer architecture exploded on the AI scene when a paper called Attention is All You Need was published in 2017. I think I thought it was on ADHD when I first looked up the paper. I thought this is gonna be great, and instead it was an AI article. This dramatic change in how artificial intelligence processed information is what led to the incredible uh, capabilities we now have. 
And a transformer is primarily used for handling sequential data, particularly tests. So it's able to weigh the importance of different parts of the input data to help it understand context and the relationships between the words or sequence of words. So the bottom line here is large language models don't reason the way we do. They're not following procedural computer code. Instead, they use statistical analysis to figure which word should come after the other based on what they see in the context of the prompt. ChatGPT by OpenAI comes in two basic flavors. There's the free version, which uses a less resource intensive and less capable version, ChatGPT 3.5. The paid version, ChatGPT Plus, uses ChatGPT 4.0, and it costs $20 a month, but it adds the ability to do internet searches, data analysis, where it writes its own Python code, and that scared the crap out of me the first time I asked it something, and I didn't tell it to write a Python program, but it wrote its own Python program to help figure out a piece of statistics I was asking about. That version costs $20 a month, but the ability to do internet searches, data analysis, um, is, it really gives it a lot more uh, utility. Microsoft owns a major stake in OpenAI, the company that developed ChatGPT, but they also have their own Gen AI that they're calling Copilot, used to be called Bing Chat only a few weeks ago. Copilot is powered by ChatGPT4, and it has access to Dolly 3, which is OpenAI's generative text-to-speech, uh, or sorry, text-to-image AI that will produce visual content. Bottom line here, Copilot will give you access without a subscription, without paying, to the same large language model used in the paid version of ChatGPT. To generate images, you need to sign into a free Microsoft account, and you can upload images, but not PDFs. You can also download a mobile app to access Copilot directly. And a few weeks ago, they added a $20 a month version that has even greater capabilities, very similar to ChatGPT+. I think the difference is it's going to be integrated into a bunch of the Office tools. So if you have a subscription to that, it'll also work within the newer versions of Office. So in late December, <laughs> Google, Trying to keep up with these name changes is a constant. Google updated the large language model used by BARD to Gemini. And there's now a free version, a subscription version, and interestingly, a nano version. I don't know, what is it, a small, large language model? But their nano version will run self-contained on their Pixel phones. Some comparisons show that Gemini is similar in capabilities to ChatGPT4, but your mileage may vary. You can upload images for analysis, but not PDFs. And Google was recently in the news because they had to pull the image generating capability because for, I don't know if any of you have seen this, it was, they were asking it to generate images of the American Revolution and it showed the revolutionaries in completely different ethnicities than what was expected. And it did the same thing for other groups. So uh, that's pulled, as far as I know, it's not back up yet. So I've been using all of these since they've been available. And I think ChatGPT, especially the subscription version, which has been available longer, is more refined and it gives me the results I'm looking for. But it's always good to try all of them. There are many generative AI applications that will create images from text prompts. I'm not going to discuss them, but I do have a list of them in the references. All of the graphics in this presentation were created using ChatGPT+. Please keep this in mind when you're putting together a presentation. Doing generative, using generative AI will allow you to create custom artwork that's only limited by your imagination and your skill in writing prompts. So this one was Great Wave in the style of Hokusai with Santa Claus and his elves in the boat. Chat GPT threw in the reindeer for good measure. So let's get on with the real meat of this. All of us have worked long and hard to gain the skills we use every day to help the students we work with. But much of the time is spent away from students doing repetitive tasks that involve writing. Now, these tasks are important because they allow us to communicate with different people and record the information that our licensure may require. But why not take advantage of the ability of generative AI to write? So in this next section, I'm going to go through a wide variety of tasks that all of us are required to do, at least to some extent, and show how AI can help you do it better in less time. And everything I'm showing you are things I've actually used. Nothing here is theoretical. So this is not just me spinning something out saying it will be helpful. These are things that I'm using almost on a daily basis. 
If you haven't used Gen AI before, you may think you need to learn a new skill called prompt engineering. Well, those of you who are therapists who do staff training or teachers, or maybe more importantly, parents already know how to engineer prompts. If you're a teacher, think about the amount of time, uh, uh, time when you were doing a small group project. You prompted your students to divide up in groups and start working, but they argued with each other about which group to be in, and some of the kids were left out. So you changed your prompt and you had the kids divide up alphabetically. Then you noticed they were not talking and not really focusing on the assignment. So you gave them an additional prompt to focus on the project and assign one of the students to write down their discussion. If you're a parent, you prompt your child that they can't have ice cream until they clean the room. They shove all the dirty clothes and junk in the closet, close the door and come back telling you the room is clean. You then realize you need to provide more information in your prompt, such as defining what a clean room is. So this is the same process you follow when engineering prompts with large language models. And I want to give credit to Daniel Lopez. He has a wonderful podcast called the AI Education Conversation Podcast for putting prompt engineering in these friendly terms. Now, I'm going to say there are different levels of sophistication in engineering prompts, but for the stuff I'm showing, you're going to see everything's written in plain English or maybe therapies, if we put it that way. So let's start with everyone's favorite thing, writing reports. And there's a handout with all these slides on it. So if you wanna review the prompt that I used, you can look at the handout and I will give it to you. So after we assess a student, we typically write a report and that report may be used to qualify a student for services and help us communicate with parents and teachers, assuming they read them. A good way to get started using Gen AI is to take the raw notes you've made doing the student observations or testing or evaluation and dump them into ChatGPT or any of the other generative AIs using the following prompt. <clears throat> so this is a typical prompt I use when I want ChatGPT to turn my raw notes into a nicely organized report. Let me call your attention to a couple of things. First, I'm telling the AI what my job is and the environment we work in. When you're using AI, you're not doing a Google search. You're trying to provide the AI with sufficient information so it has what it needs to do good statistical analysis when it's assembling words for you, right? So uh, um, I'm specifying the audience that will be reading it. That way, if I use technical terms in my notes, they'll be replaced or defined. Sometimes I didn't do it in this one. I'll add that this report is very important because it will help determine services for a student. And the reason I do that is a number of studies that show that you get considerably more accurate responses if you tell the AI how important the results are. Like, I really need to do this or I'm going to lose my job. You're much likely to, to get accurate information. Uh, it's, it's a funny thing, but that's how AIs are. But there are a few critical things, and these are really important. Before you cut and paste your raw notes into an AI, any AI, number one and most important, you need to ensure you're not providing identifying information, such as the student's full name, the name of the school, full name of staff, et cetera. Basically, don't share anything with the AI that you wouldn't under FERPA or HIPAA rules. And this is because whatever you enter into a large language model can be used as training data. And there have been some successful, they're called prompt injection attacks where people have been able to extract personal information, including bank records and other information that people have put in. So here's a portion of the report that ChatGPT generated after I pasted in the text that had been stripped of the student's full name and the name of the school. And you can specify that you want the report in a specific format, such as Google Doc or Word, but in most cases, I just cut and paste out of the chat and drop it into whatever word processor I'm using. If you have test results, you can specify that you want those results presented in a table. And I'll show an example of that when I do some feature comparison in a couple of minutes. I found that this can cut the amount of time it takes me to do a detailed report from more than an hour to typically 15 minutes or so. And the results are almost immediately useful, especially since I tell it to use non-technical language. So you'll see uh, that uh, there, the things were in pretty clear language that would be understood by most educators. After a student is assessed for a wheelchair as their PT, I'm required to write a letter of medical necessity. If you're an OT or an SLP, you may be writing letters of medical necessity for other types of equipment or for AAC devices. And those of you who do them know that these letters are quite time consuming. 
Because if you're writing for an insurance company, you have to write a specific justification for every item in the price quote. So this is a price quote from a wheelchair. So you can see all the items listed. So I have to write a specific justification for each and every item to indicate why it's needed. So let's put generative AI to work on this one. First, I'm going to copy the information from the PDF the vendor sent, which is what you're seeing here. But I'm not going to include any identifying information that links it to a particular student. And I'll paste that into the message window of whatever AI I'm using. Then I'll use this prompt to generate the letter. Again, note I didn't include any personal information. It could be traced back to the student. And because I need to specify why, in this case, a wheelchair is needed based on medical diagnosis, I included that. But again, it's not connected to a particular person. And I wanted to have a short description as to why this particular medical diagnosis would require a wheelchair. So also note, I specified I want a justification for each item to be in a table format to make it easy to read. Why not? And here's part of the letter. So you're looking at the final letter after I edited it, which is why I had to blur out the student's name. Again, the name was not put into the AI. So I'm not showing the standard header, you know, with the student's name and all the other stuff. But I, I am showing the more interesting parts. Notice that ChatGPT gave a specific definition of the syndromes that the student had and then also explained why a wheelchair would be needed for someone with those diagnoses. And going further down the letter, you can see that it put the items and justifications in a table, and this makes it easy for the reviewer and also for me to look for mistakes. And I did find one mistake where it misunderstood what a specific component was, but that's good because it means I still have a job. Um, Writing these letters is an extremely important part of what I do because insured students have the equipment they need to attend school safely. Sometimes I'm writing for equipment student needs at home. But now I can generate one in 15 minutes or less compared to the hour or longer it took me, especially when I would have to look up abbreviations that the vendors would use. Most of us are doing some staff training, sometimes on a daily basis. And we need forms that can summarize the information that the staff needs to remember so they can sign it. And so we have a record that um, they participate in the training. So this is another area where ChatGPT can save you time, not only by creating the form, but it may encourage you to have a wider range of specific training forms rather than like one generic one, because it takes so little time to write them. So let's look at this one. So in both my districts, thanks to Deb and the FEMA grant and all the stuff she's done on PEEPS, both my districts now have evacu track, e evacuation chairs in our buildings that have upper levels, and this meant we needed to have a training form. So here's the prompt I use. Notice that I used the name, brand, and model number for that specific equipment because I wanted it written for that exact evacuation tool. And here's the form it produced. Now, it only took a minimum amount of editing to ensure the information was accurate and it covered the areas that I thought were important. And note that it covers not just the training, but it reminds staff they need to double check the equipment before they use it. I found the forms that ChatGPT is creating are much more comprehensive than the generic ones I would put together before, because again, the generic ones were intended for many different situations. Thinking about the future, I, I think within the next year, we will have greater access to AI-generated video. And at that point, it may become much easier for me to make videos showing how to use equipment than the hours it takes now. But that's for the future. As a physical therapist, part of my job, and Terry will agree, that we spend the first two weeks of every school year in bathrooms. <laughs> so we're training staff how to do bathroom transfers. I often tell staff whether the kids can do math or reading their first day of school is, is important, but every kid has to be able to use a bathroom to some extent. So in Tigard, we've been able to get overhead lift systems installed in many of the schools. In fact, I think right now we don't have any students using Hoyers and only one who's in kindergarten where staff is doing manual transfer, otherwise they're using the overhead systems. The previous training form I used was quite generic, but asked ChatGPT using the prompt above to create a training form specifically for an overhead list system. I didn't specify brand or model because we have a couple of different types, although I could have made a specific one for each device if they were significantly different. 
So this is a training form it generated. At, and after I made, I made a few minor corrections and additions and note it also includes safety checks to ensure that the equipment is ready to use before the staff tries to lift the student. And you can't see here because I cut it off, but there's six lines for people to sign. Again, this was all auto generated just in response to the prompt that I put in. So here's another extremely useful way that Gen AI can help you. Have you ever dashed off an email and then moments after sending it, realize that the amount of time it's going to take you to clean up the mess you just made would have been better spent being careful about what you just said? Yeah, I see some nodding heads, right? Gen AI gives every person their own editor who can assess what's said for tone, communicating what you intended, at the very least spelling and grammar. Many email clients now have built-in AI or if you have a Grammarly subscription like I do, you can use AI to check your email in the application request a rewrite. <clears throat> but the greatest flexibility is when using chat GPT or some other large language model to check over what you wrote using specific instructions in your prompt. So here's my other role. I'm an assistive technology provider. I often have to find a way to tell someone gently when they send me an email saying the camera on my iPad isn't working, is that the reason it's not working because they put it in the case upside down and the camera's blocked. So I have to find a way to, to say this that is polite and that won't make them feel bad. So before you cut and paste, there's a couple of things I want to add. Before you cut and paste the text from your email or your document into the message box, you need to do the same things you would do with student data. Please be sure to strip out any protected information such as student name, addresses, parents' full name, et cetera. Also, after you've made changes, make sure that you don't include any of the dialogue that ChatGPT had with you when you were um, uh, asking for corrections. So in one case, I accidentally included part of ChatGPT's response. You don't sound condescending, but it could be interpreted that way. It was telling me, you know, when I asked for feedback on it. Unfortunately, that one in the email, the teacher interpreted this as me telling her that uh, she was being condescending. And it took a while to get that unraveled, or maybe I never have, because I don't think I've heard from that teacher for a few months. So here's the prompt I used to double check my email before I sent it. I didn't think the original email was too bad, but sometimes I'm not the best judge. And the key part of this prompt is specifying concerns about how the email comes across, right? So again, the situation is teacher says the camera's not working. I know the reason why it's not working, but I don't want her to feel like she did something foolish. She didn't, it's just how it is. So I don't wanna make the teacher feel like she's not very smart or I'm being condescending. So I'm not gonna show my original email, but here's what ChatGPT had to say about it. So um, it indicated that there was some condescending language because I made an assumption about how the issue with the camera was caused. And the comments in the revised email, uh, uh, the revised email shown in the next slide were exactly what I needed. When I wrote the original email, I had this niggling feeling that something wasn't quite right, but I couldn't figure out how to fix it. But with the help of a third party of this generative AI, I gained additional insight and a better version of my email. So here's the revised email. I made a few edits, so it sounds a little more like me. But ChatGPT did a very nice job of removing language that might have caused friction with the teacher. So it very gently pointed out that sometimes iPads fit in their case in more than one orientation and asking the teacher very politely to check this. So um, this is a tool I use, especially if I'm feeling angry or frustrated. Sometimes in the prompt, I'll tell ChatGPT what outcome I'm looking for. Typically, it's not letting the person know how angry and frustrated I am. However, if you are really angry and you wanna let them know it, and you wanna blow up and burn every bridge you've ever had with this person, I've got a prompt for you. So prompt, please rewrite this email using the tone and rhetorical method of the famous sermon, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. Now I used this prompt not that long ago because I was so aggravated and uh, one person on this call knows about the situation. I was so aggravated that a high school teacher insisted on putting the kid in the wheelchair in the isolated corner in the back of the room. And I could not believe that this was an issue I had to deal with. 
And I was really angry about it. So I used this prompt and I asked ChatGPT for a rewrite. So here's a small sampling of an email that will never, ever, ever get sent. It did make me feel a lot better, though. So I just love this. In your classroom, a sanctuary of knowledge and growth, young Annie finds herself cast aside, isolated, much like a lamb estranged from its flock. So I laughed about 10 minutes, and then I wrote a more typical email and sent it off. I actually used this yesterday. I'm really frustrated with a banking issue. So I had it write one of these for Chase Bank, which also didn't get sent, but it did make me feel better. In the not very distant past, we treasured charts and tables on websites that did feature comparisons of similar products. We use them as a way to help make decisions, especially in assistive technology or maybe apps that a student would use at school. Generative AI can create matching tables in seconds. And if you prompt, uh, if you craft your prompt, well, put it in a format that will make it easier for you to use and share with others on your team, including parents. So here's an example that an occupational therapist might want to use when they're looking at the benefits of different handwriting apps. Note how I specified the format I wanted the information presented in. Keep in mind, you can ask for information in almost any format, so you might as well make it easy on yourself. Although I asked for a table, if you need the information in a spreadsheet, you can ask the Gen AI to produce what's called a .csv or comma separated value. So these are files where the raw data is separated by commas. And if you open a CSV file in, in any spreadsheet, including Excel, Numbers, or Google Sheets, uh, it will turn itself into a spreadsheet. So I'm showing you this in the context of doing feature matching, but keep in mind, if you need a data sheet, uh, you need a spreadsheet to collect data. You can describe what you want in plain English and ask the AI to produce a, dot, a CSV file that you can then drop into Google Sheets and it'll create the spreadsheet for you that you can probably use with very little modification. So here's an example that only took about a minute total between dictating the prompt and it being generated. Now I didn't specify what information I needed in feature matching, but you can do that as well. Simply add it to the prompt, such as include information on price, subscription cost, et cetera. So if you look at this, you'll see that here's letter school, handwriting without tears, um, two commonly used uh, apps or methods of, of teaching kids to do handwriting. And you'll see how it broke it down into these categories. There's more on the page than what I'm showing here. A speech therapist or AAC specialist has a wide range of communication apps to choose from more than they've ever had before. So this is great, but it also makes things somewhat difficult. And this would be a really natural place to do feature matching. So this prompt will produce a table that's easy to share with team members, a student's hospital SLP, especially if you're trying to coordinate to ensure that whatever that is recommended by the outside SLP is also relevant for school. Again, here's the resulting tables. I'm only showing part of it. So I had to compare LAMP Words for Life and TD Snap, two very commonly used apps. Um, there's also information on price and a few more things that aren't shown here. A again, if I needed some specifics in the comparison that didn't show up the first time, I could specify it in the original prompt, or I could ask, please modify the table to include this information. And uh, speaking personally, I use this a lot, not just for feature matching, but when I'm trying to understand something technical or something that is outside of my uh, usual education, uh, like a, a, an educational framework. I'm not a teacher, I haven't had their training, but I will ask it to produce a table to help me understand how that works or what students it applies to. And finally, here's yet another use of Gen AI. So it's the end of another exhausting workday. You need to put food on the table, but you're fresh out of cooking ideas. With the subscription version of ChatGPT Plus or free version of Gemini, you can actually upload pictures of what's in your refrigerator and ask the AI what you can make for dinner based on the pictures. So if one of the suggestions strike your fancy, so this is what, based on what it could see in the picture, this is the suggestions it makes. I don't think there was anything embarrassing in there. No, that looks okay. I have a lot of weird, my wife tells a story of when she first met me in St. Louis, she opened the refrigerator and she said she didn't recognize anything that was on the door. And that's because I do a lot of Asian cooking and there was shrimp paste and she said these, exotic things like hosen sauce, of course, that she's familiar with now. But anyway, if you see a recipe that you want 
you can ask ChatGPT to generate a recipe for that. And if you tell it how many servings you need, it'll give you the actual uh, uh, recipe down to the teaspoon. So here's a recipe for one of the ChatGPT suggestions, that's vegetable stir fry with rice. Unfortunately, none of the Gen AI applications will currently cook dinner for you. But maybe if we finally get a household robot, as we were promised, here's another old cartoon in the Jetsons. Yes, maybe maybe we'll get a a, a robot uh, maid or a butler, and maybe by then I can finally get my flying car. So with that, I want to thank you very much for your time and attention. My hope is that the information I provided will be immediately useful for you. I'm hoping the gears are turning and you're thinking about how you can apply this stuff. Please be very sure to follow the privacy guidance I gave to ensure that students' personal information is not uploaded to the AI. Also remember to carefully check for errors and either ask the Gen AI to make corrections or make them yourself before turning in any important work. And with that, I'm gonna stop sharing. And I'm gonna ask if there's any questions and if somebody's monitoring the chat, you can let me know what's in it. Well, thank you, Bruce. I know it's given all of us some things to think about. So as you're processing this in your mind, uh, feel free to type your questions in the chat box or to unmute yourself. Please raise your hand if several of you start uh, having questions at once. Uh, the first question I see comes from Sarah. And Sarah wants to know, can it extrapolate and summarize data in a spreadsheet? Hello, Sarah. It's nice to see you. It's always good to see you. That's why I said it's great to have friends on here. All right, so it depends on which version you're using and also whether you have a paid or free. And these are kind of a moving target. For ChatGPT, you're going to need to have the subscription version for it to do data analysis. I believe for uh, Gemini and maybe Copilot that you might be able, if you can't upload it directly, but you can take a screenshot because it'll process images. So you can take a screenshot of the spreadsheet and upload it that way. In ChatGPT uh, Plus in the subscription version and in the Copilot, I don't know what they're calling it now, but their paid version, it actually has an analysis, co uh, analysis mode. And you can, and I, I used it, um, to help analyze hospital data. It was actually for my father who passed away, but to analyze hospital data to try to find patterns for when certain things were happening. And it, and it was like a lot of data. I downloaded a .csv file from the, the medical records website and uploaded it to ChatGPT. And it showed me patterns that emerged for when certain events were happening. And, and I was able to suggest some medication changes based on that. So in that case, it was worth it. But your workaround, if you're using the free versions for if you want it to analyze like a PDF or something like that, is to do a screenshot and upload it. And uh, in most cases, it will do something with it. Thanks. Thanks, Bruce. That's really helpful. I'm I'm working on creating an index for um, feeding evaluations and severity based on the uh, classifications for pediatric feeding disorder, and mm -hmm. then incorporating. Um, a workload analysis into that for every student. And so I'm really curious to see what I can come up with in terms of summary and analysis of the of the document. Let me add one other thing before I go into other questions. I think it would be well worth your while. To, the, the 20 bucks a month is reoccurring for ChatGPT+. It would be worth it for you to get a paid subscription. And I think if they still offer it, I think with uh, Google's... Um, uh, with Google's version, I think they give you two months free of the, but I haven't used that one, so I can't vouch for it. But what you can do is you can upload your spreadsheet or a PDF and you can query and ask it to produce a report, again, putting things in a table or a .csv file. So you can have it do some very complicated analysis, even give you statistical things. When Oregon Department of Ed came out with their um, with their computer science I can't remember what they call it, but it's like their computer science guidance document. It's for 2027. I uploaded it and I was able to query for the amount of times AI was mentioned and in which context and gave me table uh, with page numbers and all that so I could figure out where they were going. All right, thanks. Who else? 
that's awesome. And Sarah, as someone who's involved in the feeding conversations uh, and feeding teams, I look forward to seeing what you come up with there, sharing with us in the future. Bruce, I know that you are all over the different types of platforms and uh, uh, what our schools are using. And Joanne Stillman uh, asks us, uh, what brand of smartphone, and this may ask you to look into the future, uh, but what brand do you suggest when this technology becomes built in to the devices? All right. So I'm an Apple fanboy. So uh, so temper anything I say, because I'm going to always recommend Apple among the, uh, above other things. Apple has been extremely late to the game when it comes to AI. Now they've had on board, they've had a neural processing chip, their facial recognition and all that is all done on device. And that's using machine learning. But as far as Gen AI, they are so far behind, it's embarrassing. And they are at their next their next release, I think, is it going to be iOS 18, maybe? They're going to start building in generative AI that will be on the device process to maintain privacy. That's very important to Apple. I think they're going to do some pretty amazing stuff. But right now, you can get a Pixel phone that has some built-in AI. However, and I'm going to go in a slightly different direction, as long as you have a cellular connection, you're not dependent on on-device processing. And so right now, you can download the Copilot app, uh, the ChatGPT app for any phone and use it that way, or you can use it via browser. If the question is like, will the AI assistants like Siri or um, Google Home or some of the other ones. Uh, right now, Apple's pretty far behind, but I think they'll catch up in the next six months. Thank you for that, Bruce. Did Joanne, did uh, he answer your question? Kind of uh, always in the technology world, it depends. Yes, yes thank you. Sure. <laughs> and thank you for asking. Um, moving now to the next question, Noel Berkey, our friend at Community Vision in Portland. Uh, always talking about feature matching of tools. Uh, she wants to know, was AI able to uh, create feature matching from the available data on the apps and software that you listed? So, uh, yes. And I approached it in two different ways to test it. Now, um, OpenAI, the company makes ChatGPT, announced a couple of weeks ago that they have since up updated. The, remember I said generative pre-trained, right? So pre-trained means it's not looking at the internet as it is now. It's looking at the internet data that was loaded at some point in time. Originally, it was like, I think the cutoff was 2021 and then it was 2022. OpenAI just announced that their new cutoff was December of 2023. So, you know, their, their training day has gone up. With the paid version of all of the models and with some of the free versions like uh, Copilot, um, or if you're using uh, Google, uh, and I have to keep reminding myself it's Gemini, um, you can specify, please check the web for the most current information in your prompt. And, and it will do so. If you try to do it with a free version of ChatGPT, it'll give you something about, you know, the last data I have is as of this date. The cool thing about, um, about using uh, Gemini is you can, you can ask it to, when you, when you ask a, a question, a prompt, you can also indicate and please show relevant web links to substantiate your answer. Because I didn't go into, I didn't go into a lot of the cautions and other things other than privacy, but as most of you have probably heard hallucinations, these models will hallucinate. I've personally seen some incredible hallucinations, uh, such as I was trying to get a translated page of Japanese text that was about a particular flower. My wife does flower arranging and she wanted to, it was about Japanese lotus and it translated it about a murder in a subway in much more detail. And I said, no, that's not it at all. This is about flower arranging. Oh, yes, you're right. I'm sorry. And then it gave me the actual information. If you ask it to confirm information on the web, and especially if you do this with Gemini, it will it will show you listings so you can back check to make sure that what it's telling you actually relates to at least what's known on the web. So hopefully, hopefully answer that. So if you if you just say do feature matching with this, it will do it up to whatever date the information it looked at when it was trained. But if you specify, please check the web for the most current information, 
it'll either tell you I can't do that in ChatGPT or it will, and it should give you the more updated info. Yeah, thank you. That's Those are super helpful. Good. As you can imagine, uh, in our group, we probably have some who are beginners in this topic and some who are ready to take it to the next level and are making connections with their everyday work. Um, and uh, Nathan uh, is probably one of those people who's all about the technology. Uh, Nathan, if you wanted to unmute yourself, you could certainly do that and expound on this. But his question is, have you ever tried consensus.app? Uh, it's a research summary engine. And what's your well, feedback? Well, well, let me answer that, Nathan. I'm, I'm glad. Uh, thank you for doing that. They, they made consensus as a plug-in, like, was it? Five six months ago, all these all these services are moving targets to the extent that I have seen them change while I'm in the middle of using them. I I remember when they added the ability to upload PDFs in ChatGPT Plus because I was trying to figure a way to do it and I was using screenshots. And then a minute later, the upload button popped in that had not been there before. So at, at one point they had plugins, I think they're still allowed, and Consensus and a few other companies made plugins. So if you look on my chat GPT screen, there's a little consensus dot there. And if I click on that, it'll verify uh, the, the, prompt, uh, the information that came from the prompt. So yes, it's a really good way between using that and using Google Scholar is a good way, especially if you're trying to make a recommendation. Thanks for asking. Nathan, did you have any follow-up questions on that? No, I was just kind of curious if you tried it, Bruce. I've tried it um, in my own work, and it's been really helpful, especially as a new grad trying to keep up with um, the latest research. Uh, for those that don't know, it, it can summarize. It, it can collate all the different like research after putting a prompt, typically yes and no, um, answer or questions. Um, and then it can... It, it basically scrapes um, all the research that's out there and then provides a consensus on what people think. And it actually provides the different um, re like studies that it's scraping um, and labels it if it's a systematic review and all of that. So especially, I, I think one of the biggest issues is trying to keep up uh, when you're actually in the field, trying to keep up with all the different research that's coming out pretty much every single day um, to kind of see what everything is, what's going on. So Nathan, you and I are on opposite end of the curve. I remember early in my career, especially when I was taking a lot of orthopedic training in addition to pediatric work, I somehow had this idea I could, I, and I did some gynecologic study. I don't know what I was thinking. Anyway, there was this curve that showed like your knowledge. It was kind of a bell shaped curve. And it's like somewhere around 30, you peaked. And then we get more to clear. When my age was, it was like your knowledge I guess I'm becoming less and less relevant. I remember seeing this, that that's never going to happen to me, but it, it does happen because you have to choose the areas of specialty because it's impossible to keep up. But these tools, if I go back in the past, when I had to use the readers, and I'm going to see old, other old people, reader's guide to periodic literature, you're trying to look up something, you have to go to this massive book and look under the topic, and then you'd find the journal article, and then you'd go to the medical school to pull the journal to read it. Yesterday, there's a framework for thinking about um, how technology is integrated into, into education. I don't know how to pronounce it because I don't do acronyms, but it's S-A-M-R, S-A-S-A-M-R, anyway. But I've never been able to put a handle on it. So I asked ChatGPT to produce a table that, that um, said, how would having students use AI for writing fit within this framework and provide references? And it gave me a beautiful table with plain description so I get a handle for it and then further places I could follow up. And I didn't use consensus on that, but I have used it a lot for other things. Okay. And I have to make sure I tell my wife's story before we get off. I think we have plenty of time though. So don't let me forget that. I saw that in the chat. Okay. Who else? This is fun. <laughs> yes, it is. And, and staying on top of the technology, as you said, Nathan, is a challenge. And so you may have uh, touched on this in some of the comparison between products, but <laughs> Kim Elliott wants to know, uh, do you have a recommendation uh, between paid co-pilot and paid GPT versions? So this is, I don't quite understand this. 
Microsoft owns control, I think controlling interest in open AI. Their co-pilot uses primarily chat GPT-4. They have a smaller model that they use to try to economize. They just added the ability to what's called GPTs uh, without going into a whole lot of detail. I think GPTs are probably the future for using large language models in uh, a broad sense. A GPT will let somebody like me craft an expert prompt and upload necessary resources and test and refine it. And then I can just share the link with the GPT with someone who can just use it without having that same level of knowledge. Microsoft just added GPTs to their offering, just like it's in ChatGPT. So here's where I stand on it right now. I would go for me, ChatGPT uh, Plus, which is the subscription version, is the one I've had the best results with. It's been around the most. I've used it enough that I know some of the quirks. And there have been some real stability issues with uh, both Google and Microsoft. So I just saw a story that, that uh, Copilot, if there's a particular prompt that you put in it, it will talk about how it's going to take over the world and send drones to come and destroy you. It's a whole long story. It was in TechCrunch yesterday. <laughs> Apparently, they've patched it since then. But I'm seeing... Um, more stability on the, on OpenAI's offering. So uh, that would be, if you're going to spend 20 bucks a month, that would be what I'd recommend. If you want to try a premium one for two months, I think at no charge, um, Gemini, I believe, has a two month, at least that's what I've been seeing on the screen, you know, get two months free. <laughs> Bruce, it, just everybody thinking about and starting to make connections with how it can help. You know, so often the AI uh, conversations are framed around what we don't want it to do and trying to find a way to keep it out of our classrooms because, oh, no, we can't let people loose with this. I know that you have been very uh, engaged in uh, creating policies for your district on and uh, so forward thinking there because you were talking to your districts and you have their respect and in, in your expertise that you've started to put some framework around that. And um, so it's I, I so can... good to hear how it can help a person in their work. And these conversations start changing views on what it can, uh, what it can do for you instead of what it's going to do to you. So this conversation is one of the easier ones I do. I have a policy one that I did for the uh, state assistive tech leaders and um, for Gail Bowser's group. So these are people across the country who manage the assistive technology programs in their state, like what Deb does. And when I did my policy thing at the end, there was stunned silence for about two minutes, which Deb said never happened. And one of the people told me that she she came to a presentation I did at ATIA, which she enjoyed, but she said the one you did for Slate, I couldn't sleep after it. So if we want to focus on the concerns and at some level we need to and i'm very aware i'm reading what's the, i'm reading a new book just came out a couple of days ago and it's uh it's like ai unknowable un, unstoppable whatever it's by an expert in, in ai security i'll find the exact title in a minute so there's plenty to be scared about however if you think about it for us as therapists so number one we're adults don't well some of us I'm not sure I count myself among them, but I pass as an adult. But what that means is we don't have to worry about student data privacy. We're thinking people, we're experienced. We've all been in our professions for a certain amount of uh, a time. And so we have the ability to make good judgments for the most part. And I'm directing you to use it for some pretty constrained tasks that you're already knowledgeable about. I'm not asking you to produce a legal brief if you're that you're gonna turn into court with you not having the ability to review it. So I feel very safe in giving these recommendations. I also do presentations and train people how to use AI with students. That's a totally different conversation because of the amount of safeguards you need to take. And then when I get into policy is where all the scary stuff comes. And I'm not talking about cheating at all. I'm talking about some of the existential threats to society in terms of uh, job replacement that we're going to see. And I don't have to get into that with this group. Most of us are hands-on people. So we will probably still have work in a couple more years. And thank you for that. <laughs> um, <laughs> 
I think we're all uh, uh, relieved to hear that. And as you were saying to Nathan, peaking at 30, he's glad he's got a couple of more years. Um, but I also think, Bruce, that you've probably felt that you might have peaked uh, before, but I think that you are seeing that might be uh, might not be true now with all of the uh, engagements and the conversations that you're part of on such a big level. So uh, take what Bruce said about peaking at 30 with a grain of salt, Nathan, because uh, we all have lots of work left to do. Um, so going back to uh, our questions, um, Stacy says, and Stacy, you can unmute and at any point here, but thank you for getting us started here. It's exciting stuff. Uh, looking forward to trying it out. Um, and as an SLP, uh, wanting to share something that a colleague has done. Would you like to unmute yourself and talk about what happened in Canva? I can't hear you, Stacy. Hang on a second. Make sure your mic's in position. That's where I fell down already this morning. Go ahead. That it's not working. So it's not as cool as I was hoping it would be. Can you hear me now? No, You're not broken up. Well. You're breaking up. One more thing. Turn turn off your Bluetooth. Use your <laughs> how many how many AT people do we have on here? We'll all <laughs> we've all got a solution, don't we? Uh, I have well, let me see. One can more hear thing. you great. No, you're good. Oh. Oh, right ahead. my old my old standby uh, headset always comes in in the clutch. Gotta um, have one. <laughs> I have a colleague who's been using uh, one of the AI image generators um, in set in settings with students where, like, just eliciting language is one of the goals. So trying to get them to, you know, tell the image generator what to draw, and it's just been a lot of fun. I've started dipping my toes into that myself and I have been starting with Canva. You know, I'm kind of neutral on it right now. I'm I'm hoping for something free and I'm just wondering if you have sort of a go-to image generator. Yeah. So when I uh when I do my presentation for teachers, I, I talk about an actual experience I had working with a kid with ASD where we working collaboratively and this is a kid who didn't want to have anything to do socially, but when he saw the power of what a couple of words he said could produce an image. Exactly. We spent 20 minutes creating some sort of fast food restaurant that was right out of his head. So um, Dolly2, uh, D-A-L-L-E, if I'm doing it right too. So that's OpenAI's free image generator. You will have to have an account so that they're sure you're not looking, trying to do stuff that you shouldn't do, but you'll have to log in, but it is free. Dolly3 is available built it as part of uh, chat GPT plus. So when I like all the images I generate for that, I don't have to go to a separate website for that. I can just put the prompt in the same engine I'm doing, but um, it's, it's like anything else. Um, play with it. You, you produce an image and say, that's not quite right. Can you do this or that? Um, it, the more you specify, is it a drawing? Is it a photograph? Is uh, I'll, I do a lot. That's like Japanese woodblock print in the style of Hokusai or some other artist. I like, there's a, and I'd have to look up the name. There's a AI powered communication app that you put in the topic and it uses AI to, I think it's pulling images. I hope it's not generating them and I'll explain, ask, I'm going to explain about spelling in a minute. But what the idea is, is it's about a $15 app. So I may buy it and play with it. The idea is if you're trying to have a conversation about a particular topic, a student who's nonverbal could immediately have a range of images that they could use to try to express what's going on right then and there without somebody having to make a new page set. That That's not really what I'm looking. I actually have some goals with AAC and I've written some Python programs. I won't go into that now, but here's one thing to keep in mind. If you're using AI image generating, it can't spell worth a damn. And I, I have dyslexia in addition to ADHD. And it's hysterical that it spells worse than I do. So I have a consulting contract with the Savas uh, Learning Company, and I needed a building with the word Savas on it. And Savas, has, is it two Vs? I, or two, I think it has two Vs. So it, it just put in a line for one of the, a slanting line for one of the Vs. It didn't even put the letter in. And it, it misspells to the point of it being comical. And it's because... It knows how to spell when it's writing text, 
But when it's creating an image, it's just using graphics. So it doesn't have any idea how to put letters together. Try it, have it like put together uh, a, some, a school with a with a handicapped parking sign or something. Watch how it's, it may have three Ps in it. I love that, Bruce. And, and when you're talking about using for um, you know, visual supports and SLPs and using symbols, of course, in communication, I was at several uh, sessions at ATIA uh, last month where they talked about this student is just so motivated by dinosaurs. So now in we're able to get them engaged, they uh, did show a smiling cartoon dinosaur who has green uh, spiked hair uh, exiting a forest with a big smile. And so that was so, for some reason, having it so personalized to what the student loved, it just really brought them in and, and uh, made for, uh, uh, for literacy really and being able to share those experiences. So there you go. Uh, going back to the chat, I don't know that we have anything in there. Just let me look. Uh, amazing for art projects. Uh, thank you for that, Chandra. Absolutely. Uh, Bruce has a story about a dragon with grilled cheese. Uh, so at this point, we don't have other questions to be addressed. So we may want to hear about the dragon with grilled cheese, but I know we all want to hear about how you and your wife got together because of AI. So tell us some stories, Bruce. You got you got time. I will. I want to open the dragon with grilled cheese, though. I have it right here. Okay, let me screen share that. Yeah, so this is basic. Oh, yeah, so this is uh, the prompt was a dragon eating a grilled cheese sandwich. And um, this was part of doing like an art activity with a kid. The point I wanted to make in producing this is um, is that for students that are AAC users, this is talking about uh, the type of thing I train teachers on. For the very first time in their lives, they'd be able to create meaningful artwork that's straight out of their heads using an AAC device. So even if it takes, the one of the stats I saw is like oh, a minute point something per word, depending on the user and what they're trying to do. But if you put five words together in a prompt, you can produce like that dragon, uh, and then you can continue to refine. You can say, well, that's not quite right. I want the dragon to be purple and it'll redraw it. Our, the main reason that I've been, and I will get to my wife's story in just a minute, but the reason why I've been doing all this is in November last year, when I saw what ChatGPT could do, I was completely blown away thinking about the impact of our students with disabilities. And I could also see that if I didn't jump on it, districts were gonna ban it. And that kids with disabilities would not be part of the conversation. The conversation would be about how kids can write a better college essay or how computer program, and all that's significant and important. But for the students that we work with, we have, they can have the ability to do meaningful academic work instead of a lot of the hand over hand or things that pass for what they're doing. Many of our students, have sufficient intellectual prowess to be able to produce much more meaningful work, but they're sharply limited by uh, their um, physical limitations, uh, neurodiversity, whatever. Um, so those of us who do assistive tech, when you, when you talk to a teacher about using audio support for reading, every now and then, not so much anymore, but the teacher will say, well, that's not really reading, that's listening. And I'm like, okay, we you know table that. I don't really care. You can discuss that with your colleagues. What I'm concerned about is a student has the ability to gain the information that the other kids have in a way that they can process it properly. Well, we could have the debate. Is it really writing if you write a prompt and ChatGPT produces a two paragraph paper? Well, again, for me, for many of our students, being able to produce three words a minute on a keyboard, and one of the people here knows what I'm talking about, is not ever by copying a word that's written will never be a way for someone who has sufficient imagination to spin out a story to get that out of their head where other people can see it. All of the things I've talked about today for you folks are, would be true for the students in that the more you use it, the better you get. The, you know, most people, they sit down with ChatGPT and it's like doing a Google search. And I have to tell them that's, and then they don't like the results they get. Well, that's not how you use it. 
you have to think about what information you're putting in. You have to specify a role for the for the AI or explain what your role is. I'm a pediatric physical therapist. This is why I'm doing it. This is the audience that it's for. The more a student uses AI for writing support or for art, the greater capabilities they're going to have and the more what comes out is going to be what they want. So uh, I'll step off my soapbox. But the reason why our teachers need professional development and our districts need board level policies on appropriate use of AI is so the kids who will probably benefit the most from it have access to it. 